Well, welcome to another edition of Live Since You Asked. It's the show that zooms in, see what I did there, on St. John's Prep alumni who are achieving at uh, remarkable levels uh, across the country and around the globe. I'm your guest host, Chad Konecki, standing in for Headmaster Ed Hardiman, who is attending to pressing matters, and uh, Paul can probably clarify this, but according to Einstein's theory of relativity, he can't be in two places at once. So the Paul I'm referring to is Paul Nyhaus, class of 2000, who happens to be the 2020 St. John's Prep Distinguished Alumnus Award recipient. Give a little background before we get going. A native of Danvers, Paul is the co-founder and chairman of Give Directly, and that organization started as a roundtable discussion among graduate students and has turned into a global nonprofit that puts money directly into the hands of the poor. He earned his PhD in economics from Harvard in 2009 and is an associate professor of economics at UC San Diego from where he is joining us, sunny San Diego. Uh, since its incorporation in 2009, Give Directly has received financial backing from Google, GiveWell, and Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskovitz's philanthropic foundation, Good Ventures, among others. Uh, I'm going to let him tell us how the company works, but it has been named by Inc. Magazine as uh, one of the 25 most audacious companies and one of the 10 most innovative companies in finance by the publication Fast Company. Uh, Paul also founded two other emerging markets digital payment companies, uh, including the enterprise and social justice payments platform Segovia. It's a pretty well recognized name. Uh, and in his capacity at UC San Diego, he works with emerging market governments to improve the implementation of anti poverty programming. Paul Nyhouse, thanks for joining us. Chad, thank you for having me. Chad, I just say um, I'm joining you from, uh, like most of us, from my bedroom, not from UC San Diego, but otherwise everything you said was spot on. <laughs> okay, a bedroom, fair enough, but it's still sunny. Still sunny. Um, hey, you know, something that struck me, I read a quote uh, when you were addressing an audience at St. John's Prep when you were here earlier this year as part of your distinguished alumni role, and you said, we haven't started a new charity as much as we've started a new perspective on charity. It's a perspective that lets our legacy be the story of someone else's success. And so sort of using that comment as a springboard, can you give us like the layman's version of what Give Directly is and how it works? Yeah, sure. I mean, the way I think about it, Chad, is let's say that, um, you know, let's say that I happen to have been fortunate in life and made a lot of money and you haven't. And I'm thinking about what, what can I do to help you? Um, you know, at some very basic level, there are two ways we could go about that, right? One is that I could figure it out and decide, you know, what's going to be most helpful to Chad. Um, and the other is that you could think about that and decide, you know, what's going to be most helpful to Chad. And, um, you know, for almost all the history of, you know, foreign aid and international development, the last 50 years that we've been thinking about this problem of how do we reduce uh, or accelerate the end of extreme poverty, um, when we've asked that question, implicitly the answer has been we should decide. Right? We should be the ones who figures out what, what people in developing countries get. And so, you know, Give Directly was created to, uh, to question that, right? And to get us to ask, you know, when are we actually the best at figuring out what some farmer that we've never met over on the other side of the world should have? You know, should they get goats or chickens or what? When is it actually better um, for them to figure that out for themselves? And, you know, when you look in the data, I think it'd be hard pressed to make the case that we're generally better at it than they are, um, if you look at what the data <laughs> say. So. So speaking of the data, that's something that really intrigues me about your business model is you guys actually use scientific methodology and math to see how effective the gifts that you're making are and you can tweak accordingly. I mean, you're a math guy. Is it really all about the math? I mean, how do you guys do that? It is and it isn't. Um, so the way I think about this is first just some context. You know, it's only in the last 20 years or so that we started doing really serious, rigorous testing of how well things work in global development, um, sort of like A-B testing, if you will, if you're a tech guy. And a lot of people don't know that. And so, you know, we've been doing this for decades and decades, but a lot of the received wisdom, the sort of things that we think we know about what's effective and what isn't, um, you know, really haven't held up once we started testing them. And that's good, you know, that's, that's what learning is all about. So we're learning new things, some things that we thought worked well don't, some that we thought wouldn't work, like just giving money to people and letting them decide what to do with it. Uh, turn out to work better than expected. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, that's part one, and that's definitely been a big part of GiveDirectly's success. You know, we were started by a bunch of people that were looking at that data and saying, hey, like, given these data, we'd like to be able to give away our own money. Um, and we've continued to do a lot of testing as, as we've gone, I think, 14 or 15 of these experimental trials now um, that have become really a big part of the definition of who GiveDirectly is as an organization, is that culture of rigorous testing. Um, but I guess the other thing I'd say, Chad, is that, you know, for a lot of people, that's what draws them to give directly, and that's great. Um, but I think there is also an element here of just justice, um, which is that some people are born with massively more capital and access to other privileges than others. And, you know, there's a part of me, at least, that says, even if somebody else isn't going to make the very best possible use of this money, I feel like it's fair that they get to try. Um, and that they have some of the same opportunities that I've had in my life. And so I think for a lot of our donors, that that sense of justice and of fairness is a big part of it as well. Yeah, that's a message that resonates pretty easily. Um, I was curious, wow, I got some birds in the background. I'm Sounds curious, nice. um, it, it's, you know, I, this question I wish I didn't have to ask, but it's hard enough fighting poverty uh, as it is uh, in, in normal circumstances, but, um, in what manner has the current global health emergency uh, impacted, you know, your ability to execute as an organization and and your goals as an organization? It's been a remarkable time for us um, in in two senses, Chad. So the first is that operationally, um, you know, you're right that for many of the organizations that work at trying to alleviate extreme poverty, this has been a really tough time operationally, and they've had to pull back because so much of these models depends on face-to-face uh, -face contact with people, getting out there and interacting. And you know, one thing I'm really proud of and impressed by what the team at GiveDirectly have been able to do is that they've been able to very quickly pivot to ways of providing money to people, getting money into the hands of people who are being hit really hard by this um, without any physical contact. And so there are different models in different places, but we're up and running here in the US with an opportunity to give to people who have been hit hard um, and also in five countries in sub-Saharan Africa uh, through partnerships with telcos, with other NGOs. And wow. so, um, you know, that's been really cool to see. And I think, you know, reflect some good strategic choices we made, kind of investing in general uh, technologies that let us do that. Um, and also just an innovative culture, which it's, uh, it's just neat to see the team embrace the challenge and spin these things up within days. Um, so that's been great. Um, the other thing that's been really interesting is I think, um, you know, the biggest challenge that we face as an organization is that, you know, people are understandably a bit skeptical of this approach, right? I think that, um, you know, you've, you've probably heard, like, you can't just give money to poor people. It's not going to help. It's not going to make a big difference. Um, and I think that that mindset is changing a bit during this crisis where a lot of people have this sense that, like, wow, we're really all in this together. And so uh, in the conversations I'm having, there's a lot less uh, othering of the poor, of people who are victimized by this, uh, much more receptivity to the idea that these are people just like us who've been hit by a really tough circumstance. And so that's been amazing to see. And, you know, the, the, the numbers are, have been amazing to see. I think we've raised about $100 million in the last two months, which is double what we did last year. And so the response has been awesome. And we're honored by that and excited to deliver that money. And the big question I have is, will that last? And can we make that mindset, that respectful mindset uh, stick? That's incredibly refreshing to hear. And it's amazing how, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, I guess they say. And 100 mil in, in eight weeks or nine, I guess it is now. Wow. Um, so we talk a lot about um, role models here at the prep, just shifting gears a little bit. And I'm curious, you know, have mentors played a role in your career development and should we seek out, should we all seek out mentors as we move through our professional life? Yeah, I mean, I think mentorship, good mentorship is invaluable and it's also hard to come by. And <laughs> so I've had, you know, some, some people in my life who've been incredibly impactful and to whom I'm deeply grateful. And there have been many times in my life when I've said, you know, where are all the mentors and why isn't there someone who can tell me? <laughs> what I need to do. And I think especially when you do things that are different, that are weird, and they're not the beaten path, um, you know, it's harder. There aren't going to be as many. Um, and to some extent, you just have to live with that. So, um, but, you know, I think, you know, two things. One is um, there's also an enormous amount you can learn from the people that are there side by side with you in the trenches. You know, if you're with good people that are looking at some of the same problems and asking some of the same questions. Um, and so that's been huge for me. I've had great partnerships with a couple of people that have been uh, career defining for me. Um, and, you know, I think the other is just the value of people who know you as a person, even if they may not know the right answer to a particular problem. 
Um, so like when I think back to my time at the prep, you know, being there for four years and getting to know some of the faculty over that time, I had, I took German with Chris Lynch, you know, the whole way through. And so I think Chris got to know me pretty well as a person. And so by the end of that time, you know, he was able to, uh, you know, speak truth into my life because he knew me, um, even if it wasn't something that had to do with German or where I should go to college or something like that. And so I think really treasuring those people as well. That's a great answer. Uh, I'm curious if you had to identify one aspect of your of your time at the prep, of your educational experience and co-curricular experience there, you know, either concrete or or abstract, that you can point to and say that had something to do with my ability to navigate the path I took, you know, at Harvard and then MIT and then getting a PhD and now as a as a global charitable entrepreneur. Yeah, there are, there are a ton of things. I mean, you know, just to give you some sense for me, uh, the prep was the first school that I went to because I'd been homeschooled before that. And huh. so, you know, I had a lot of math and writing and things like that to learn to be ready for college, but I also had to figure out, you know, who I was and how to fit in with other people. And so it was, you know, defining in a whole bunch of ways. Um, one concrete thing I think that stood out for me was um, one of the, you know, a lot of us have defining failures, you know, kind of big setbacks, things where we really strike out at something that we care about. And then how you deal with that then becomes something you carry with you and can look back to. And so, um, you know, for me, not making varsity basketball the prep was a big one because I, I love playing basketball and I played freshman in JV and uh, we had a great varsity team and I didn't make it. And uh, so I ran track and I had a wonderful experience. I'm really grateful to the folks I ran with and I ended up winning the track MVP my senior year. Ray and the coaches thought that I was worthy of that. Who knows? Um, but it became one of those things where I could look back to later on and say, you know, when I fail at something that I really care about, I can look back at that and say, you know, it sucks. Like, I would have liked to have made the varsity team. But I look back and say, well, you know, I was able to switch gears and do something else and ended up being successful at it and enjoying it. And so I can take that and carry it with me. So that was a great experience. Yeah, I hear that pivot story a lot, uh, especially as it relates to student athletes at the prep. You knew, yeah. did you? Know a, lot of people, a lot of people come to the prep and don't make varsity. So. <laughs> like, but then, like, make the Hall of Fame and something else or win the uh, MVP. Yep. Did, did you know Coach Boyle during your time here? For sure. Yeah. So he just got inducted into the Massachusetts Track Association Hall of Fame. It's great. So pretty it's amazing. Very yeah. I'm um, sure he showed no emotion whatsoever. <laughs> it is hard to get a quote out of that guy. <laughs> Um, so what, uh, what would you, if you had to give advice to a current high school student, maybe not even necessarily the prep, um, who want to do well professionally, but also do good professionally, um, how do they do that at the same time? And sub question, what are you looking for when you're, when you're hiring someone? Yeah, it's, I mean, first, I guess, because I've had the opportunity to work in a whole bunch of very disparate spheres, you know, as a researcher, as a nonprofit entrepreneur, as a for-profit entrepreneur, it's, you know, it's different. And so there are no one thing. Um, and I think, you know, one of the first things I'd say is that I think that what I mentioned earlier about uh, cultivating relationships with people who really know you, um, yeah. I think can be incredibly valuable. I think, you know, a lot of us have the tendency to gravitate towards the most famous person in the room and ask for, you know, look for generic advice and say, what are some generic patterns that you see or things that you think would be helpful? And, you know, there's some value in that, but so much of it is about understanding who you are yeah. and what things about you really shine and are going to impress. And so I think getting uh, honest feedback on that sort of stuff from people who know you well um, is super valuable in anything you do. Um, I guess the other thing when it comes to having a career that's impactful that I encourage people to think about is, um, you know, I think a lot of people associate that pretty mechanically with doing some work with a nonprofit, um, whether it's as a volunteer or as a, as a career or serving on a board or something like that. And there's certainly a lot that you can do that way. Um, but there are just enormous opportunities to do really impactful work and create a ton of value uh, for people, for poor people, for disadvantaged people uh, in other ways as well. And so, you know, I've had that opportunity by starting these fintech, helping to start these fintech companies that work in Africa, companies that are, you know, providing the payments platforms that get cash transfers into the hands of very poor people, uh, right. company, the consumer remittance company that's letting people send money home, like right now, right? People mm -hmm. uh, in Europe sending money back to their families who have been hit hard by the shock. Um, and so, you know, they're just great opportunities there if you go out and look for them as well. Um, and so I'd keep your eyes open for those. Another good answer, man. I was curious about, um, 
your perspective on this. We we talk a lot with students here about um, adversity and overcoming an obstacle or back to the drawing board moments, you know, being a natural uh, and, and as it happens, necessary a mile marker in the in the road to success. Um, do, do, can you give a real life example of that from your career? <laughs> They're endless, never, right? So, um, you know, that, that one I mentioned, I think uh, was a, that was an important first one um, for me, for sure. Um, I think that, um, and one that I've carried with me the rest of the way, um, I think that um, in my academic life, you experience this a lot and in a very painful way, because the way uh, academic work goes, you, you write your paper, you spend two years working on it, you send it off to a journal, and then, you know, some people, some anonymous referees you've never met, take a quick look at it, like, ah, I hate this, this is crap, and they send it back to you. <laughs> and so you kind of go through a lot of this cycle of rejection over and over again, um, actually. And so, um, you know, there's something to be learned from each of those experiences. Uh, they never stop stinging a little bit. Um, but, you know, one basic lesson from all of that is that you do build up a thicker skin and, uh, you know, you start to see the big picture. And I think that's very helpful. Um, and uh, and very good, but it's um you know I think it's also something that comes with time because when it's your first big thing like your first project your first paper whatever it is and it fails or it hits a roadblock it just feels devastating because it's like you have nothing right um, <laughs> I remember this the first paper that I ever wrote when we would hit an obstacle and we thought the paper was done we'd be like that's it like my you know my entire life I have nothing to show for it I have no papers. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, once you've written 10 other papers and done some other things that you feel good about, then you sort of feel like, well, okay, I see, like, you know, one, one failure is not the end of the world. So, um, you know, I think that's just something that comes with time and something that you can look forward to when you hit that first big roadblock. Talk about a, talk about a mentorship-like comment. Um, hey, I'm just going to give uh, do a quick mini speed round, what we used to call the speed round, um, before we get to some, some uh, viewer questions. Because I've got quite quite a few in my queue, I don't want to ignore them. But uh, it, just a real quick speed round, you know, short answer, first thing that comes to mind type stuff. Uh, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what profession would you most like to try? I um, Chad, I, there, there's a part of me that really that dreams about uh, being out in nature and doing something very simple all by myself like farming or something like that where there's you know i'd have total peace and quiet and uh, <laughs> that would be selfish so i'm not going to do that um but uh but there's that um i mean to, I just, there's so many things like i would love to cook i would love to take two years and go to professional cooking school and uh, and just become an amazing chef and be able to make myself anything that i want um, mm -hmm. And I think, I guess, you know, to me, the broader point is, I'm sorry, I know you asked for a quick answer, but I'm going to tell you. No, that's like, okay. I love it. Like, I, I thought a lot about, like, for me, like, extreme poverty has been this defining thing, right? That, like, I want to, that's my my life's purpose is to do everything I can to try to accelerate the end of extreme poverty. And that's been awesome. But I thought a lot about if I didn't have that, like, defining purpose, then, like, what the hell would the point of life be? Right? <laughs> And I guess the thing is, I think that we're all like, there's a part of all of us that's creative and that loves to create and to build. And so something like that, where I can kind of create, whether it's great food or great art or something like that, I think that's the other part of me that I would do more of, if that makes sense. Wow, yeah, that's the most nuanced answer I've ever had to that question. It was very thoughtful. Um, <laughs> of the five Zabarian values, which you know my heart, but I'll read them off. Simplicity, <laughs> humility, yeah. <laughs> Simplicity, humility, trust, compassion, and zeal. Which one of those speaks to you the most, do you reckon? Well, it probably depends a lot on the day, doesn't it? But I, I guess, you know, humility is one that I've been thinking and talking about a bunch recently. Um, I love, and I shared this passage, I think, when I spoke um, at the prep um, from Philippians, Philippians 2, 3, where it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition, but with humility, consider others better than yourselves. And, you know, when I've thought about what we do at Give Directly, I think that speaks so directly to it, because I think the big challenge we have is that even when, when we're trying to do good and we're trying to help people, and that's great, and it's to be lauded, but we do have this tendency to consider ourselves better than others and to think, well, because I've been successful and this person hasn't, it means that I am the one that should figure out how to fix their life. And so, you know, a lot of what we're saying is actually let's be humble and recognize privilege and good luck and um, let's empower other people and see what they can do. So I'd say humility. Wow, yeah, I like the depends on the day though. Um, last one before we go to questions, in your spare time, 
would you, <laughs> which I'm sure is copious, um, would you rather read something, watch something, or listen to something? Read. Wow, that was definitive. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's I love to be able to go at my own speed. And if you listen or watch, you have to go at the speed of, you know, whoever made it. So. Yeah. It's all those journal rejections, isn't it? That's why you're obsessed with reading. Well, it's everything is going the other way, right? So like ESPN yeah. used to be all like long, dot com used to be all long form journalism and now it's all video and it's like, it's just killing me. So, but yeah, you know, I hear you. I'm an okay. Old <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's start with, um, uh, this is a question from somebody who apparently knows you a little bit. Well, does Paul remember his PR for 400 meters? <laughs> um ballpark yeah i know i had a split a, a relay split that was under 50 but i think my uh my my per, for the for the for the solo for the individual race it was just over 50 i think it was in the 50 point something 50 point something in the open's pretty good man it's moving right. along pretty good doesn't um, it wouldn't really uh, raise any eyebrows out here in california but it's all right. no 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 um hey so i have another one um Thank you for speaking to the folks on campus in the advanced research capstone course. Uh, when you visited um, with all the people you're helping around the world, do you have any advice on how to form community and grow in solidarity together from a distance? Hmm. Real interesting. I mean, I, I've been thinking about this a little bit because one of the things that I would love to do at some point is to spotlight a little bit the people that have been involved in what we've done. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that have been pivotal in the growth of GiveDirectly and the, you know, the folks that I've met through this have just been amazing because as you can imagine, the kinds of people that like are willing to give away a lot of their money with no strings attached to the extreme poor are, they're interesting, they're fun, they're kind, they're good people. Um, and then, you know, the people getting the money, right, have had all these crazy adventures and everybody does something different with it. So, you know, I've been thinking a bit about how can we uh, build community around that and make all of that more visible. Um, and so I don't have a, a definitive answer to that yet. Um, but, you know, one thing I will say very practically is that what, you know, one thing I've found is that in this crazy time as we're all stuck at home, um, people are super receptive if you reach out and say, hey, you know, we've never met. I've always wanted to grab coffee with you and you know, want to do a virtual coffee and just get acquainted. And uh, so I've been getting to know some, you know, there's a long list of people that I've said, you know, that person does something really interesting. I want to know more about them. And, uh, you know, it turns out a lot of them say yes. So I would have you know, a shot. Yeah, that's fascinating. Fantastic. Um, I bet we'll see more of that. Um, I'm a student and I'm wondering what I can do to benefit populations like those you serve through Give Directly. I guess you sort of touched on this already, but um, any expansion on the notion of seeking, seeking out opportunities to do that? Yeah, sure. So I'll say a few things. Um, I think um, giving is one for sure, um, and there are awesome opportunities right now because we're at a time when you know money just has even more impact than it usually does. Um, you know, folks in some of these countries, we're looking at you know populations where you know 50, 60 percent of people have lost the bulk of their income, and these are people that weren't making much money to begin with. Mm. So um, you know that's just a tremendous opportunity. Um, and you know, looking ahead, you know, as you think about your career, one thing you could do is just do something very successful. You know, be successful in whatever you're doing work is and then uh, donate. Um, and that means, you know, you can take on whatever fun, lucrative challenge you want and share a lot of that money with people that don't have it. That's great. Um, two would be to actually work at Give Directly. And so, you know, we are always looking for really great talent and in a whole bunch of different areas, a whole bunch of different functional areas and different parts of the world. Um, the thing that I think actually doesn't help much is volunteering, to be perfectly honest. Um, and it's always great when people reach out and they're interested in giving five, 10 hours a week of their time. So it's very much appreciated the spirit of it. Uh, I just think the reality is that organizationally, it's hard to get that much done with people whose commitment is that limited and that uh, that contingent on what else is happening in their life. And so we try to be really upfront with people. We say we really appreciate the spirit of that, but that's just not the right way to build a successful organization, at least for us. That's fascinating too. Another student question, um, a young entrepreneur and hoping to carve out a career in the FinTech industry today, can you talk about what you think the future of fintech may be? Mm. Um, I can't give you a grand vision, um, at which I would love to be able to. Um, I can give you a few observations. Um, 
So I think that uh, you know the part of it that I'm most interested in and keep a closest eye on is is what's happening in the emerging markets and developing countries. Mm -hmm. And um, the you know the big story there over the last few years has been something that's not really all that techy. Um, it's been the growth of uh, sort of last mile infrastructure. So in mm -hmm. Africa, for example, a lot of the stuff that we've done is built on these mobile money platforms. And you know you say mobile money, and so you think about the cell phone and the software and the digital wallet, and all those pieces of it. But really what it, the insight and what the breakthrough has been is that suddenly people have access to a whole network of cash out points that is like the vendor, like the shopkeeper in their village or their town, whereas before they might have been 100 miles from the nearest uh, branch bank or ATM or something like that. So it's, you know, it's tech enabled, but the, the sort of brick and mortar aspect of it, the boots on the ground, is really what's been uh, the big breakthrough. And so I guess that's, you know, perhaps a broader point to keep in mind, that it's about the intersection of the technology with people's physical real lives, um, and it probably will be. You know, that said, there may be a second breakthrough where people really switch to using these things as a digital wallet, for, where they don't take the money out of their phone at all, and they start using it to buy things at their local shop, and that could be the next, you know, all of us now use, well, most of us use a credit card or something like that, right? So that could be one of the next big transitions. Um, another thing is a lot of folks are interested in what's going to happen with cryptocurrency, and uh, I am too. Um, I can tell you a couple of things. I think that for most people in the countries we work, it's not uh, there isn't clear value add yet. Um, the exceptions to that would be places like Venezuela or Zimbabwe where there's hyperinflation, and so believe it or not, Bitcoin looks like a relatively safe, <laughs> stable alternative. <laughs> um, so you know there are places like that, and so that's nice. Um, but some of the other places where I think it could be transformative in the long run is um, sort of foreign exchange, moving money across countries. Um, those markets are very decentralized, they're very opaque, and uh, liquidity can be low in some quarters. And so, you know, that's creating opportunities right now for people that are building really profitable businesses in the emerging markets. Uh, but in the long run, if that all flows through cryptocurrency, you can start to see the spreads come down. That could really be game changing, I think. Yeah. Ah, uh, wow, that's just, it's a lot to think about. I think we have time for one more. Um, what have you seen those who have received funds do with them that has either been surprising or inspiring? It's, um, I mean, it, it, we've reached hundreds of thousands of families now, and so there are hundreds of thousands of stories. And, you know, here are a few observations. So one is there's a lot of stuff that looks just like kind of common sense, right? Like people buy livestock, People pay their kids school fees, they improve their house, things like that. And so, you know, in a way, I think that's important because it tells us that all these things that you see charities doing, right, like giving people livestock, paying for their kids' education, it's not, these aren't crazy things. You know, there are like a lot of people for whom that is priority number one. Uh, but then, it, you know, at the same time, there are these interesting minorities that do something very different or very creative. Um, one of my favorites, and actually one of the first uh, folks that we gave money to at Give Directly, uh, bought a bunch of musical instruments and started a band. And actually uh, recorded a song about Give Directly, which we have, you know, it became our theme song for a little bit. Um, it's uh, hey, it's not really my style of music, but it's all right, I guess. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, you see wild stuff like that. Um, you see, I mean, you see some stuff that can be a bit edgy, right? So you see someone that like pays bail, right? Or, uh, uh, you know, or somebody who uses the money to get out of an abusive relationship, for example, because they have the financial independence to do that. And, you know, one of the things that's been most interesting to me is that when we ask people about what they're doing with the money and what their goals and objectives are. You know, I'm sure not everybody tells us everything, but sometimes people are pretty open and candid about that. So um, it's real life and you get to see a slice of that. And I think that's good and healthy. Just one more quick insight from you. You know, I thought of the time, again, I read some quotes from when you were on campus and you talked about being a leader, you know, in the corner office is is, is more about uh, now you're, you're, you have to focus on other people's journey and other people's success and um, it's so well aligned with what you guys do as a company but we talk so much about servant leadership on campus um, is that something that was ingrained in you at the prep or in your family or and how important is that to to approach the world with that attitude uh, anything I do can benefit somebody else like Philippians I mean, for me, it was, you know, it's just something that I had to learn the hard way as I transitioned and started doing more managerial work. Um, because, you know, I think that the, you know, the honest truth is that I'm very jealous of my time and I like to be able to look back at the end of the day and said, oh, I did something today that I feel really proud of. And if I spent, you know, 10 hours straight in meetings that day, giving people feedback and trying to, you know, set direction and answer questions and 
you know, uh, deal with tough HR situations and things like that, you know, you look back on that day and it sort of feels like, oh, what do they do, right? Like <laughs> these people keep taking up all of my time. And so at some point I had to, I had to like look at that and say like, I think I need like a more fundamental like reevaluation, uh, resetting a perspective on sort of my role here. Um, and, you know, I think it is that, that perspective that like what I'm doing here is not directly uh, achieving great things or creating awesome content, but it's enabling a lot of other people to do that. And uh, so, you know, I still grapple with that, but that's kind of, that was the, the personal experience, I think, behind that comment. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough for, for sharing your perspective on a variety of subjects um, today. And I, uh, I know you're on Pacific Coast times. You probably had to, you know, get a busy start to your day and giving time away, which is very valuable to you. So we really can't I, I, time with you guys is very valuable to me, and uh, I'm really glad that we were able to do it. So, ah, Paul Nyaus, class of 2000, the 2020 distinguished alumnus. Uh, thanks for joining us and keep in touch. Thanks, Chad. Take care.